like to introduce Isabel Krim. Isabel works at the Center for Cancer Research in Lyon, France, and she has a simple talk title, but a big topic, uh, NMR for Fragment-Based Drug Design. So Isabel, if you'd like to take the mic, that would be great. Really, I'm very happy to be here for this very special day. And I really thank all the organizers for giving me this opportunity to, to speak a, a little bit about the use of NMR in um, fragment-based drug design. So NMR is a very powerful method for fragment-based drug de design. So I had to, to decide <laughs> what I am going to speak about. So I decided to focus on the use of uh, 1D proton NMR experiments, uh, like the saturation transfer difference and the water loxy experiments. But I also want to, to say that um, just um, to mention that I am also very, um, uh, I use a lot of noisy experiments such as the so-called in pharma and interligant noisy experiments. And I really consider that very beautiful experiments to do drug design. But yes, today I'm going to uh, really focus on STD and water loxy. So in the world of fragment-based uh, drug design, we have a, a very interesting blog uh, which is called a practical fragment blog. And here we can, for example, on this figure, have an idea about all the techniques that are, that are used uh, today uh, to do uh, fragment screening. And as you can see on this figure, uh, both ligand detected NMR and protein observed NMR still are in the top of five techniques that are used both by, by academia and in industry to um, uh, to perform fragment screening. So, okay, so it, it is well known now that um, NMR is a very, pretty, uh, very powerful method for fragment screening, and in particular, STD and water loxy experiments, because you really use a very, um, a very low quantity of protein. Okay, but so one of the issues is that when you do a fragment screening, for example, you can have a lot of hits. A typical fragment library is about 1,000 um, 1, fragments. And so it means that if we have 20% of hits, you still have to deal with uh, 200 uh, fragments. So, so how do you prioritize them? What information can you use um, and how to use, again, enamel uh, to have an idea of the best fragment or the one that looks like the more interesting fragments. So again, you can have information just looking at the STD and water loxy spectra, because not only you have an information about the binding. So for example, in this picture, you will see this very simple catechol fragments, which is bound to the serum albumin. So this is just a model to show you that you can just compare the intensity of your STD, which is in green, with the intensity of your normal 1D spectra. Of course, the experiments have to be in exactly the, similar, the same uh, experimental condition with the same parameter. And you see that if you just compare the relative intensities, you have no difference between the STD and the 1D. And the same is for the water loxy in the presence or in the absence of the, the target. But if you look at the same compound, that, that, and this time with another target, you have the same kind of, of answer. I will say that you just have also one STD spectrum, and you also have an answer with the water loxy experiments. But the situation is different as compared to the HSA protein, because here you see that if you compare the relative intensity of the STD to the 1D and the water loxy in the presence of or absence of the protein, you see a difference. And in particular, you see that, that for this very small um, compound, you see that for the H1, you have one low STD and low water loxy uh, intensity. And this is because this proton is solvent exposed when it is bound to the protein. So if we compare the same compound when bound to the serum albumin or when it is bound to this protein called 
compare the X5, you see that you have an information that you have a preferred orientation for this compound uh, when it is bound to the uh, peroxyredoxin protein, while you don't have such a preferred orientation when it is bound to the serum albumin. So you can really have this information, which is very useful to discriminate fragments that are interesting, because what you want when you do a fragment screening is to pick, to select fragments that have a preferred orientation, because it means that the interaction are interesting and not ju just due to uh, hydrophobic interaction. Okay, so um, I talked about STD, saturation transfer and water looks T. So uh, what about the artifacts that you can have, especially with very uh, small compounds such as fragments? So one of the artifacts is that you have to be very careful with the mixing time that you will use for the water looks -y. Because what water looks is, is uh, on is just a noisy between water and uh, water and your compound. And if you look carefully and you compare the water oxys you observe at different mixing time, you will see that you will have different results. For example, with this compound here, you see that you will observe that the signal you have for the H1 proton, the intensity of this signal will differ will depend on the mixing time you use. And why is that? It is because the H1 you can see on this compound three uh, is uh, near, is close to a labile proton. And this is this, is this um, phenomenon that is also um, in the water loxy intensity. So you have to be careful with that and because if you compare the water loxy at low mixing time, such as 0 0.25 seconds, the water loxy will look like uh, the one you have in the absence of the protein. So you, don't, you lose the structural information. And if you compare with uh, another compound on the right here, where you do not have uh, any, um, any labile, labile proton, you don't have this, uh, this issue because if you uh, compare all the water loxy uh, data at different mixing time, you always have the same answer because you don't have this issue with uh, the water exchange with labile protons. So this is something that you have to be careful. And just another example about uh, use of STD and uh, information about the binding mode without any structural information from X-ray is when you compare, for example, this uh, fragment that is bound to the kinase ERC or to the glycogen phosphorylase GPA. You see that you have uh, different STD intensities for both proteins. But what is interesting is that if you look carefully at the uh, intensities, you will see that the binding is very different uh, uh, um, for uh, the same compound when it is bound to ERC or GPA. And you will see that uh, the ERC binding is due to uh, polar interaction while uh, the compound binds to GPA through apolar interaction. So for example, here, it's more interesting to use this compound for the kinase ERC than, than it is interesting for GPA because we are looking for polar interaction because this is an interaction that will give, um, that will give um, better selectivity uh, when we will um, use this compound and uh, grow the compound to a, a, to a drug. So here, this is just to, to remind also that there are other artifacts uh, both for both uh, STD and water So you, uh, for STD, because you will use um, um, one frequency uh, around the methyl compounds uh, so that the STD, the transfer of the resonance is, is powerful, you have to be careful that your compounds uh, does not have uh, the same chemical shift as the resonance you will use for the STD experiments. So you have to, 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 to select uh, what is the better saturation frequency for the experiments. Uh, also, uh, STD is not very sensitive for low molecular weight receptors. 
And in this case, water looks is better. But one advantage of the SCD is that you can use very large uh, ligands uh, on protein ratio, which means that you will use very few protein. While for the water oxy, you have to be careful. So, so it means that sometimes you have to use different samples um, for STD and for water oxy. Even if I have to say that most of the time you use the same tube. Uh, both experiments are of course sensitive to the T1 relaxation of the ligand protons. And you have to be careful with that uh, to avoid artifacts when you uh, use your data and compare the ligand uh, STD intensities. And of course, as I said, you have to, uh, to be careful when you have exchange of protons and the best is to use uh, different mixing times so that you can see uh, the influence of the mixing time on your data. Uh, another application is to use saturation transfer difference for allosteric ligands. Uh, so when you do drug design, uh, halosteric ligands are very interesting because they give, uh, they are supposed to, um, to be highly selective uh, as compared to uh, ligands that target uh, catalytic sites and um, what we call orthosteric sites. And so the idea is that if you use a fragment as a spy molecule, and you look at the STD, uh, as the STD uh, NMR spectrum of the spy molecule. If you had an allosteric ligands, normally the, you will have an allosteric transition. It means that the binding site will have a different conformation. And therefore, your STD should be different for the spy molecule because the binding site has a different conformation. So this is very useful because this is quite difficult to look at allosteric transition. And especially if you um, do some synthesis and modify your allosteric ligands, sometimes you completely change the allosteric transition. So this is very interesting to use this to, um, to be sure that, that when you modify your allosteric ligands, you always have your, um, um, your allosteric transition. And uh, as a proof of concept, uh, we, can, uh, we used the glycogen phosphorylase, um, which is uh, uh, a protein that exists in two halosteric forms, uh, GPA and GPB. And there is one uh, active site. And together with two allosteric, uh, two different allosteric sites with uh, ligands that are known to, uh, um, to bind those uh, two different allosteric sites. So this is a very interesting model to look at uh, the application of STD for allosteric transition. So uh, as a proof of concept, the first thing uh, is to, um, to look at the STD of fragments in the different allosteric form. So this is just a comparison of the STD of three spy fragments bound to GPA and bound to GPB uh, because there are two allosteric forms of the protein. And as you can see on this figure, indeed you have different intensities. This is not very big, but this is very, you can repeat the experiments and you always have the same data. So it means it's really, uh, uh, it's, it really means some things, and this is some, uh, one reason that you can repeat and you always have the same relative intensities for GPA or GPB. So it really means that indeed, if I look at the STD of one spike fragments in uh, two different allosteric form, I do have a difference in the STD because the STD experiment will reflect uh, the change in conformation and the dynamics of the protein. So now we want to look at transition, not to look at um, uh, two different allosteric forms, but we want to transform the GPB towards the GPB. So we do the same STD experiment, uh, but we will um, this time, for example, we, we, we are going to look at the STD experiment 
on GPA, and we will add on the NNR tube the caffeine because caffeine is known to uh, promote uh, the T state, which is similar to the GPB. So when we add caffeine, we go to the GPA to the GPB form, and we observe exactly the same um, STD differences. Uh, between uh, the STD of our compound in the presence or in the absence of caffeine, because we can compare the, the, the sorry we can compare the, the, the data in uh, B and uh, C, and you see that um, you have exactly the same uh, sorry the same difference. So this is really. Uh, something that you can repeat. The difference is tiny, but um, you always have the same data. And the same thing is done uh, for uh, another compound that is bound to GPB. And in this, this time, you can use um, AMP. And AMP is known to promote the air state. So you will transfer, you will go, I would say, uh, from the GPB to the GPA. And here again, you see that we, hold, we observe exactly the same differences for the STD of, for the, STD of the um, spy fragment. So this is just a proof of concept, but it means that using STD of a fragment that is bound to a catalytic site, you can uh, look at what is the effect of your allosteric ligands that you are going to design. And this is uh, quite in interesting because this is very simple and rapid. And so you can compare also the impact of a series of allosteric ligands and look how much you are able to go from an allosteric state to another, uh, depending on the structure of your allosteric ligand. So now I, I want to switch on uh, the use of NMR uh, in uh, GPCR, um, uh, GPCR screening, because GPCR are uh, very important targets. Um, about one third of small molecule drugs target GPCR, and they are highly druggable and still very interesting for um, indust pharmaceutical industry, but very challenging to handle. This is due to the fact that they are membrane protein. And um, for example, if we look at the NMR, the use of NMR um, in fragment screening, you only have three reports. Uh, two of them uh, are the so-called TINS uh, method, where uh, you use 1D experiment uh, to look at uh, the, the the, it's, it's a T, T2 filter. And the third experiment is the STD that we have done in our lab uh, with the Calixar company, which is a company that is uh, able to produce uh, GPCR samples. So uh, the first thing was to look at uh, the possibility to use NMR uh, to look at both um, antagonist and agonist um, binders. So the first experiment is just uh, a proof of concept that we look at, uh, we are able to see the STD signal of an antagonist uh, bound to uh, a GPCR, which is here the adenosine receptor. And if we look at uh, this STD signal in the presence of a competitor, you see that we do not observe anymore the STD signals, which means that uh, we are able to uh, displace this compound and that we are able to use this NMR experiments to look at the binding of um, compounds bound to the orthosteric site of the receptor. And we have similar not exactly similar, but we have same kind of experiment with agonist, which is adenosine compound. So if you look at the aesthetic signal uh, in the presence of the uh, adenosine receptor, you have the aesthetic signal showing the binding. 
And if you do a competition with another compound that is um, known to bind the same site, uh, you see that you still observe one STD uh, signal, but the signal is reduced. I will come back to this just after that. And so uh, we, we used this uh, STD experiments to try and perform a fragment screening. Uh, so the first idea was to do a mixture of five fragments. Uh, so how to, to do that? We, we just um, mix five fragments in, with a um, GPCR, the adenosine receptor in my cells. And what is very important is that because uh, we are in, uh, in detergent, we use um, the receptor is, is, uh, is in uh, my cells, so you have to be very careful and record the same experiment in the absence of the receptor because you, you can observe binding of your fragments uh, to uh, the, the lipids. So it's important to uh, check that you have a specific binding to your receptor. And so um, we were able to look at uh, hits and uh, identify uh, fragments from mixture of five fragments. But because uh, the um, GPCR is a very uh, difficult protein to, uh, um, to have and because it is also expensive and so on, we, we wanted to look at the possibility to use mixture of 10 fragments to um, reduce the quantity of the receptor. And again, it was, it was, it was okay. But you see that, um, so we, we just screen, um, not a complete uh, library, but more than uh, half the library, uh, 640 fragments, and we had a high hit rate. So uh, you see the, how it is important also to use additional um, information, such as the one I, I showed you before, uh, so that you, 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 you can um, choose and pick the best uh, fragments that we use to do chemistry and begin the drug design because 21% uh, it's, it's, it's a huge amount of fragments to deal, to deal with. So wh what I wanted to show you is that um, uh, I come back to the fact that when we do the competition of uh, adenosine bound to the ad adenosine receptor and we had a competitor, I told you that we still have the STD data even if it is different. Uh, so it means that in the presence of uh, the competitor, the adenosine is still able to bind to uh, the, the receptor, but in, in another binding site. And if you look at the intensities, you see that not only uh, the STD intensities are different, but the relative intensities also, and this is uh, quite important. So it means that, uh, in fact, uh, the proton in, in red here is uh, as a different exposition, and this is uh, one of the most important um, data here. It means that in the second banning site, uh, this proton is is, is the sorry in the first binding site the proton is burnt, but in the second binding site that uh, is found by uh, for, for the adenosine when there is a competitor. So in the second binding site, the proton is solvent exposed. So this is a very simple, um, very very simple information to have a, 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 such a, an interesting information, and this is related to. Uh, previous uh, experiment where uh, both molecular dynamic simulation and X-ray structure also um, proposed that the adenosine is able to bind at two different binding sites and with a very different binding mode also. And you see that indeed, as, uh, when you look at the anomeric proton, you see that in one binding site is burned while it is completely solvent exposed. So uh, NMR was able to look at those two different binding sites and binding modes and are in complete agreement with these two different techniques, uh, X-ray and molecular dynamic simulation. Um, so uh, 
STD is very powerful to look for allosteric site on a GPCR, and the idea is to compare uh, STD experiments in the absence or in the presence of a compound that will bind at the um, catalytic or orthosteric binding site, what is called orthosteric here for GPCR. And just to, to show you some uh, statistic data, at um, looking at all the hits we had for the GPCR, we, we observed no differences for most of the hits, but we were able to um, see some differences for 9%. So, um, yeah, I just wanted to show you also briefly that we, we, we can um, also screen in the presence of a uh, membrane. So we can use uh, GPCR not, in, not only in my cells, but directly in membranes using, an, uh, using a noisy. So in the presence of five or 10 fragments, but here you really have to look carefully at the intensities of your noisy to, to, to really identify um, so it's, and so I would say that the best is to start with noisy uh, in membranes, but you really have uh, to validate your it's uh, using STD experiments. And if you want to look, to go further and uh, search for allosteric ligands, you then go to the STD uh, with um, not 10, because uh, you, you, it's difficult not to have superimposition, but we're using mixture of two, for example, and you compare in the presence or in the absence of an antagonist, and you will have your uh, allosteric ligands. So uh, this is just uh, to remind that uh, yeah, I just had some, uh, I showed you what you can do using STD and water OC experiments about the multiple binding site of fragments on proteins, the binding mode assessment, and how to um, select your fragment, and also how you can use both fragments and enamel to look at uh, uh, allosteric transition of proteins. And so it was, um, I would say, a holder work that uh, I, I did before. Um, um, now I am um, developing uh, compounds as tools and therapeutics in the new lab, uh, as uh, it was uh, said in, in the introduction, at the Center of uh, Cancer Research in Lyon. And so I use Anamur, but really to uh, design and um, make uh, heat to lead optimization in order to go uh, to therapeutics.